Today in this video we're going to look at a time period that spans from technically the end of the Civil War all the way to about 1970s. So a long time frame but we're really going to focus on the 1950s, 1960s and look at the Civil Rights Movement. Now when we talk about Civil Rights Movement we're not just talking about um, expanding the rights for African Americans. We're also going to see there's a lot of other groups that uh, get more rights during this time as well. So let's start with the origins of the Civil Rights Movement. First of all, we had three amendments that were passed after the Civil War, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. So these are after the Civil War. We have 13th that abolishes slavery, 14th, which grants citizenship to those born in the U.S., which includes all of the former slaves born in the U.S., and then this is one that's going to come into play with African Americans and with other groups, and that's this idea of promising equal protection under the law. The 15th Amendment is the one that granted the right to vote um, for African Americans. We're going to see that they're going to find a loophole for this one later on. And then another one that's going to help with rights is granting women the right to vote. Uh, part of the issue with the Civil Rights Movement is, yes, we were given these rights, but states and areas are going to find ways to create loopholes and to keep African Americans from voting, which again, if they vote, they're going to vote people in office that are going to support what they want, which could change law and policy and a lot of people that were currently in government in the 50s and 60s. A lot of them didn't want to see that happen, so there were ways that they kept people from voting, such as um, we're going to see later things like poll taxes and um, literacy tests and other things, you know, intimidation and violence and those kinds of things to keep people from voting. And, and, the 50s, 60s, and even before that. So kind of the beginning of segregation and the major issues is going to start from this court case in 1898, and that's uh, Plessy versus Ferguson. And this is one where the Supreme Court said that you can have segregation, which again, segregation is separation of races. And the Supreme Court said that this was okay as long as it was equal. So if you're going to make... Um, African Americans ride in a separate bus to go to work, then that needs to be the same kind of bus that white people are in. Or if your kids are going to go to school and African Americans have to go to a special school for them, then they need to have the same level of education, same type of books, the same type of uh, building as for the white schools. And what was what they found out pretty quickly was that separate was not equal. And a lot of times the African Americans got secondhand books or ones that were really old or teachers that weren't well qualified or run or they were in rundown buildings. So I started to see this wasn't actually equal. So the first uh, case that's gonna have to do with education and and with equal protection of the law is gonna be Sweat versus Painter. And this is in 1950 and this happened in Texas, had to do with the University of Texas, and there was a African American law student and they had him in a separate Law school, as they called it, is pretty much they put him in a kind of like a cubicle in a building separated from everybody else. And uh, so whenever this went to court, they said that this was unequal because it kept him from interacting with the other students in the law school who are going to be lawyers that he would later have to um, maybe go to trial against. And so he's not getting that opportunity to interact with them, which would help him with his training and being an attorney in Austin. So they uh, this is going to be the first little case with um, saying, you know, having these separate schools is not equal for African Americans. The big key turning point for the Civil Rights Movement is going to be Brown versus Board of Education. And this was a case where um, African American families, not just Brown, that she was just, that was just the first name in the list, sued the Board of Education in Kansas and said that they were that the separate school was not equal and um, actually this guy right here Thurgood Marshall Thurgood Marshall is going to be the attorney that um, supports Brown and is for, is for the NAACP and in this case they the Supreme Court had a unanimous decision because they knew they had to serve a message with this court case so unanimous decision and they said that they were going to desegregate at all deliberate speed and as you can imagine, Southerners and people that were against uh, desegregation took this at deliberate speed. They interpreted it however they wanted. At deliberate speed could mean whenever the federal government made you desegregate, or it could mean, oh, in about 20 years. 
So this is something, this is where the loophole is going to be with Brown versus Board of Education, but this does pave the way legally for desegregation overall. Another part of the civil rights movement is going to be the idea of boycotts and um, marches and ways to kind of protest that are nonviolent. So we're going to start with the Montgomery bus boycott. This is in Montgomery, Alabama, and Rosa Parks, who was an NAACP member, she was a seamstress. Uh, we've all heard the story. She refused to give up her seat for a white passenger, so she was arrested. And this arrest led to a 13-month-long boycott of public busing in Montgomery, Alabama. And it was led by Martin Luther King Jr., who was a local pastor. And the, actually with this boycott, it ended up being very successful. African Americans really rallied together. They would carpool to get each other to work. Um, the case was even taken to court. Uh, Martin Luther King, for leading all of this, he was even arrested during this time. He was, um, his house was bombed during the boycott. But again, they kept the boycott going. And the big significance of this is it showed that African Americans can unite successfully to oppose segregation. So in 1963, another major movement with the civil rights era is going to be the March on Washington. And this is a pretty famous event. This is in 1963 where Martin Luther King and other leaders, they march on Washington to advocate for a new civil rights bill. This is considered the largest demonstration for human rights in U.S. history. There were over 250,000 people attending the march. And this is also where MLK gives his I Have a Dream speech which is a very iconic speech, and we'll look at an excerpt from it here in a little bit. After the uh, rally, MLK met with President Kennedy and talked about uh, what they could do to get the Civil Rights Bill passed. And unfortunately, that this was a few months after this meeting is when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. But one of his acts that he was really championing was a Civil Rights Act. And so after he passed away... Uh, Congress really wanted to honor the things that were proposed by President Kennedy before his death. And so that really encouraged and that led to a kind of a, a more successful vote on the Civil Rights Act and it actually being passed in 1964. So this march really did have an impact because it did lead to um, civil rights being brought to the national, international stage and eventually Civil Rights Act being passed. Another group that... Um, practice with nonviolent protesting is what we call the freedom riders. Freedom riders, one of the other parts of segregation is, let's say you want to take a Greyhound from Dallas, Texas to uh, Kansas City. Well, even Greyhound buses or public, you know, public buses were also segregated. And so what this, this group is an interracial group. So you had blacks and whites together riding in a bus throughout the South with the goal of ending segregation on public transportation. This was a very, it ended up being very violent. There were times where their buses were attacked, as you can see in this picture up here. Um, they faced violence often, and uh, it even created confrontations where the federal government would have to intervene, which again brought national attention to this issue, which was one of the goals for the Freedom Riders. On the other end of this, we have people that are trying to keep segregation from happening. You have George Wallace, who is a governor, and he's going to pledge to resist segregation. And you even have um, Lester Maddox. He was a restaurant owner, and he would not allow African Americans into his restaurant. There was even a story where he wielded an axe to keep the African Americans out. And later on, whenever integration was happening, he sold his restaurant instead of letting African Americans into the restaurant. We also have Orable Falbus, who was the governor of Arkansas. And one of the other events during this with trying to desegregate public schools was what we call the Little Rock Nine. This was nine African Americans that were trying to attend Little Rock High School. And the governor, what he did is he ordered the Arkansas National Guard to surround the school to prevent these nine from entering. And even President How Eisenhower during this time had to send troops to ensure that the nine could attend school. Falbus wouldn't even offer protection for those nine African Americans when they went to school, despite all the threats 
of violence against them. So he was another one trying to keep desegregation from happening. We also had a group in Congress, your, your Southern congressmen, that banded together. And anytime they tried to pass civil rights legislation, they would always band together and try to keep this legislation, keep those laws from uh, passing. You even had ones that were on committees where whenever a bill is trying to become a law, a bill goes through a committee and has to pass through committee before they can vote on it. So some of these guys were co committee leaders and they kept these laws from even, the, sorry, these bills from even exiting committee to even be voted on. So that was another example of trying to maintain that status quo and not trying to change things and desegregate and have more integration and equal rights. Two famous writings during this time from Martin Luther King Jr. One is the letter from Birmingham jail. This is a classic work of protest. MLK was arrested while leading a march in Birmingham, Alabama. And in his letter, he's explaining reasons why African Americans can no longer patiently wait for constitutional rights. So this is an excerpt from one of his letters. And we have in here um, things about... For years, I've, I've heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with piercing familiarity. This wait has always meant never. We must come to see that justice too long delayed is justice denied. So he's talking about waiting for your rights, waiting for desegregation. And then he's noticing that when you tell us to wait, that means it's never going to happen. So we're noticing that justice has been denied to us because it has been so delayed. So this was another example from Martin Luther King of protesting for his rights. Another famous piece from a primary source from Martin Luther King Jr. is the I Have a Dream speech. And this was given at that March on Washington. And the goal of the, and the main idea of his speech is talking about how he looks forward to the day when Americans of all colors can live peacefully together. And again, here's an excerpt from the I Have a Dream speech, and he's a very eloquent speaker and uses a lot of literary devices, lots of uh, different rhetorical devices. Uh, some parts on here that I'd like to point out is, um, I have a dream that my four little children will one day in a, live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And in this, he gives various examples when he says, I have a dream of where different groups, black and white, are doing things together and it doesn't matter what the color of their skin is. Also, during this time, uh, there were some legislative actions that were passed to address minority rights and executive actions, which would be actions by the president. One of the first ones that's going to help with paving the way for civil rights is going to be the desegregation of armed forces. And this was an executive order issued by President Truman in 1948. And uh, the fighting during World War II in some of these segregated armed forces and the contributions of African Americans in World War II is going to be a major contributing factor in this desegregation of armed forces. There are two civil rights acts that are passed during this time. There's the... Um, Civil Rights Act of 1957, which gave a little bit of rights, but not near as many as 1964. It gave federal courts more power to register African-American voters, but 1964 is going to be our bigger one. It's going to be desegregation of public places. Uh, it's going to have uh, cutting federal funding for segregated schools, which is going to kind of help with that deliberate speed of desegregation. And again, it's going to give federal government the power to register African-American voters. But there was still this issue, this hurdle that got in the way of voting for African-American rights, and that's going to lead to the Voting Rights Act uh, being passed in 1965. The Voting Rights Act ended poll taxes. Poll taxes is when you had to pay money to vote. You had to pay to vote. And a lot of times, a lot of your African Americans are poor. They can't afford those poll taxes, so they couldn't vote. It also suspended literacy tests. This was a test you took to see if you could, quote, read and write. But then the t when you look at an actual literacy test, they're designed for somebody to fail. Even um, somebody uh, that's very intelligent still wouldn't do well on those literacy tests. But they had certain loopholes, again, where even if a white person took the literacy test, they could still be eligible to vote because you had to go through various, um, you had to jump through all these hoops to get the right to vote. And one of the many ones was literacy tests, and that was the one that usually kept African Americans from voting. It also provided bilingual assistance to language minority voters, so this helped with the Hispanic population. And then also the Department of Justice could monitor elections to ensure they are conducted fairly. This happened a lot in the South, and actually 
Um, just in the last year or so, one of the places got out from under this restriction. That was Selma, Alabama, which is one of the hot spots with um, civil rights. And they just recently got out from under this monitoring by the Department of Justice because they want to monitor and make sure that they're still ensuring that elections are conducted fairly and that people are able to register fairly.